It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ko Yu Jin, Professor of Economics from the London School of Economics, uh, as well as Professor Xiaolong Fu, uh, Professor of Technology and International Development from the University of Oxford. Now, um, they will both present their horizon scan, which uh, they focused very much on uh, the future trends for China. And we'll hear from both of them as we start the session, and then we'll get into a bit of a discussion. So do uh, feel free to uh, start thinking about uh, your questions and come in to the discussion as we, as we move into the second part of the, uh, of the discussion. So with that, without further ado, over to you, Professor Kuyusha. Thank you so much, Stefan. Good morning, everybody. So nice to be with everyone. Um, so as we look into the future and China, it's probably safe to say that China has entered a new paradigm, a new model of growth, saying goodbye to smokestack industries, over-reliance on investment and exports, and welcoming a new era based on sustainable growth, technology, and innovation. And in this new era, GDP growth is no longer the sole developmental goal, but there will be more demands for a softer metric of development such as raising standards of living, better environment, food security, and safety and stability, etc. So the shift from just growth to something that has a broader spectrum, represents a broader spectrum, I believe is um, a goal, very important near-term goal for China, especially in a world where inequality is rising, there's disenchantment of the new generation, there's new, new, new um, complaints about freewheeling uh, capitalism, each nation is uh, debating these key issues. And um, how, does, how would China get there? In the meantime, China has fostered a very unique model. We usually think about China as having a pretty centralized approach, a very dominant role of the state. But in fact, that is also um, under, uh, uh, kind of under-emphasizing the huge amount of autonomy that's passed down to the local officials. China actually has a very decentralized economic model, not a, pol a political centralization, but economic decentralization. And there's a huge amount of vivacity and creativity on the ground, aided by local officials. If you look at the unicorn second to the number in the United States in China, it's distributed geographically all over China in places where many of you have not visited or even heard of, second tier cities such as Hefei, Suzhou, um, Wuhan, and all these amazing cities. And how did they create uh, uh, kind of this kind of level of innovation? It's that very unique model of local entrepreneurship married to local officials, enabling them to create supply chains, coordinate the finance, helping business to overcome key um, barriers, uh, just think about the EV sector, this renewable, uh, the renewable sector where China is now leading in a matter of 10 years. Uh, how did that happen? Well, part of it is the government installed 4 million EV charger stations around the country, as opposed to 140,000 in the US. So that role of the government in a very nuanced, uh, different way and all these mechanisms is very much what defines China's unique uh, capitalist model, which is what we call the state and the mayor economy. A third trend is, of course, the rising, um, uh, uh, let's, let's say, competition in technology. Uh, that has got to be a key theme. In the past, we talked a lot about trade and investment, but in the new era, the race to dominate key technological sectors is very much a very important uh, trend that will spill over to all over the economy. But I like to think about it as competitive collaboration. Uh, and this is especially true in the, in the uh, greenfield sectors where you know, Chinese battery makers are uh, really world leading, leading and they're building factories in Germany and uh, American and Japanese companies are investing in Chinese companies so that they can learn and bring the technologies to a bigger market. And that is that kind of competitiveness, competition is actually what spurs technology forward. We often forget that. We think about rivalry as something that's potentially uh, has negative implications. But in fact, that's what keeps technology frontier being pushed uh, further and beyond. If you think about the US versus Japan in the 1980s, the semiconductors race, as a result, we all have cheaper and better uh, uh, chips, uh, products. 
consumer products. So that will be a defining uh, a moment. But just to, just to say that the technology race and how China will endeavor to achieve that innovative goals will also be very much revolved around the growth model, the decentralized economic model. Um, and now, the very interesting uh, uh, part of the Chinese economy, I believe, will be the new generation, a radically different generation that has grown up relatively privileged and prosperous and especially confident, very different from the past generations that have seen so much vicissitudes uh, in China through this turbulent era. The new generation has a knack for lifestyle consumption, likes to borrow, even beyond their means. Uh, they like to consume, they like to spend, they have busy lifestyles, they're cosmopolitan, many of them have traveled abroad, many of them have studied abroad. Uh, they also represent a very positive force uh, connecting China and the rest of the world in the new era. Uh, as many, many international surveys show, they're very open-minded, they care about social values ranging from environment to, to uh, equity to uh, you know, far-flung animal rights in Africa. Uh, many, many surveys show that they care about diversity and that kind of values converge with the new generation of the rest of the world. The new generation, of course, like the new generation, every part of the world also has their own challenges in an era where the opportunities are uh, not as plentiful as the previous generations and they're facing their own challenges of diminished expectations. So how to harness that uh, new generation, that positive force is a very important a goal that I think will have a very positive influence on the world. Thank you. Let me stop there. Thank you. And over to you. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, and also thanks the forum for giving me the opportunity to, to share my horizon sky, scan for the uh, China's future scan in the next few years. Uh, I'm a professor of technology and international development at the University of Oxford, and I'm also now a new social entrepreneur as the founder of Oxvalue.ai. I think China's future economic growth at the current stage is at a critical transformational, is at a critical future kind of transformational stage of its development. And despite there are a lot of significant challenges for China's uh, economic growth, innovation and modernization is likely to be the major driver for China's next wave of economic growth. And so the next few years, we are going to see a transitional period, changing gears transition period. Firstly, let's look at China's innovation. Um, we will see an evolution of China's innovation model. And a new model is on the horizon. China's innovation has benefited greatly from an open national innovation system. However, following the tensions in geopolitical tension and also oh, the painful sanctions, China's innovation model will evolve. evolve to a model that the state and the domestic players will play a larger role. The speed and the quality of innovation may be affected in this new model. However, innovation and the diffusion of innovations will be deeper and wider uh, you know, for the country as a whole. And also this geopolitical tension and the other multiple global crisis is likely to persist in the next few years. And as a result, a very costly regionalization and the diversification of the global value chain will continue, although at a slow pace, at a slower pace. In addition to these external challenges, China also face, faces domestic challenges, especially significant use unemployment, an economic slowdown, and also rattled business confidence. So all this will be challenges for the 
Chinese government and China's modernization need a more effective policy and, and strategies to make it you know, more effective. It is the best of times, and it is also, it is the worst of times, and it is also the best of times. Despite of the challenges, there are also many opportunities. In particular, a GPT-led technological revolution and also the green transformation in China, which will open new green windows of opportunity. So in China, the green transformation underlined by a government kind of long-term goal to reach carbon neutrality by 2060 is likely to be the, one of the most important long-term trend for China. Although sometimes, you know, it may be obscured by some short-term uh, distractions, this will be one of the most important long-term uh, um, trend for China. Secondly, we know nowadays in the world and in China, there is a GPT, Generative Pre-Trend trend, Transformer. This new technology-led digital oh, technological revolution. And this technology re revolution will provide huge potentials. China has world-class digital infrastructure, uh, infrastructure but, and also very strong digital skills among the labor force. Therefore, China is likely to benefit from this digital revolution, not only because there are uh, kind of new jobs created and new industries provided, and also there are huge efficiency gains. And of course, a company to this digital revolution, there will be, you know, uh, other social, important social implications, including employment opportunities in the traditional sector, increased income inequality, and also multiple ethical challenges. And uh, <clears throat> in addition to these opportunities, and, and the challenges, the next few years, we are going to see a reconnect, revitalization, and also confidence building period. So we will see a reconnection and a revitalization of the Chinese economy, and also a confidence building, you know, uh, in, among the companies, investors, and the consumers. We know after the, the uh, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, people's working behavior, people's consume, consuming behavior also changed, not only you know, among the young generation, as Ke Yu has uh, 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 explained, but also in the wide society, in the wide society. So this will be a very important transition period. Therefore, looking China's future growth paths, we are going to see a double kind of S-shaped curve instead of a single S-shaped curve. To create this second curve, second growth curve, innovation and modernization are likely to play a major role. And the, the years ahead, in the next few years, we are going to see a transition, changing, gear, changing gears a transition period. And how long does it take will depend on to what extent and how quickly China can be transformed into an innovation economy. So there will be this transition period precede a faster economic growth, and this period may be an important gradual buy-in kind of uh, time for long-term investment. That's all from me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for these uh, two uh, overviews. And, and before opening up uh, to, to bring all of you into this, I, I just would like to uh, tie together um, a, a couple of the points that you both uh, made. I mean, you both touched upon the importance, of course, of innovation um, 
Ku, you, you talked about uh, the, the, the technology race and how um, uh, China may position itself as an uh, innovation leader in that, in that space. And of course, you, you uh, brought up um, importantly that uh, perspective of, of innovation. Now, where do you see, um, uh, maybe both of you could, could comment on that, where, where you see the biggest momentum, uh, the biggest uh, opportunities for that uh, innovation uh, ecosystem to uh, to evolve in the coming years. I don't know, Koyu, do you want to uh, do you want to start with that? Or? Um, well, there's a difference between uh, technological uh, mastery of technological applications, high tech, and breakthrough, groundbreaking technologies. And I think China's money, talent, um, and market uh, positions the very self to do very well in the first two. But the real challenge is groundbreaking technologies, and that requires a lot from the civil society, a patient nation, patient people with patient capital, basic research, um, a, an intrinsic motivation of curiosity mm. rather than extrinsically driven by profits and returns. That's a transition that China will have to slowly um, uh, embark on uh, before it can make groundbreaking uh, technologies. But I'm more confident on mastery of high tech and, of course, the many applications. Right. Yeah. Shalon Hout. I think China's uh, innovation ecosystem and the national innovation system is evolving and also building up its capability. Um, according to the World Intellectual Property Organization, China's innovation index kind of ranking raised from number 32 in 10 years ago to number 11 last year. Uh, and also in China, I think the next few years we will see on the one hand, diffusionary innovation will, you know, greatly spread into, uh, in the country following this transition uh, and also following the, the de uh, development of indigenous independent innovation capacity. And at the same time, groundbreaking innovation is one of the bottleneck has been for China for many years. And I think China is building up this capacity, looking at China's publication in science, engineering, and medical science, is building up and contribute to the world kind of knowledge base. And that's a very important uh, contribution China is making and is in the kind of fostering stage. And we will see, after this gradual change, a breakthrough in, in breakthrough uh, fundamental innovation from China. Mm. Fascinating, yeah, and then uh, both of you also in that context touched upon the, the importance of the young generation, right, um, in, uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the consumers and the new, uh, new generation uh, that you touched upon, uh, Ke Yu, uh, but also then their role in the challenges of, of, of transformation and building this new uh, innovation uh, model. Um, when, when we survey, and uh, you touched upon this, uh, Ke Yu, when, when, when we uh, survey uh, young people globally, we have a community of global shapers, some of you may be uh, here in the room. Um, we, we also see that, that conversions around some, some key themes uh, and, and, and concerns in that, in that generation, particularly around sustainability. Um, but how, how do you see that reflected in, in that role of the new generation in, in China in facil facilitating that transition? Do you want to start with that, uh, Sharon? I think that the young people, they are the future of the world. And also uh, in China and in, you know, uh, elsewhere, like in the United Nations, I also see uh, earlier in, in the Science Technology Innovation Forum uh, of the United Nations, I see how young people are proposing new agenda and pushing for challenge, uh, changes. And in, the, in China and in Oxford, the students, my own students, they are the major force, you know, pushing forward changes in curriculums and also in our research, bring a lot of attention to sustainable development, to biodiversity, to labor standards, uh, etc. So they are really raising the awareness and also driving the change in, in the world. Um, so I am very confident, like in China, with this new generation, they are, they are very different from, from my generation. They have global vision, they are very well educated. No matter whether they have educated abroad or they are grown up edu educated in China, internet and the open um, country, 
the open economy has given them th that exposure about how the world is rapidly changing, and they are now bringing up their voices, uh, you know, uh, pushing changes, especially societal changes, mm. environmental sustainable development. And, and Kuyu, that's really a central theme also in your new book, right? The new China playbook that, that you just uh, re released of the, the, the role of that, that new generation. Can you just maybe elaborate and, and, and comment on what, what Xiaolan just said? Uh, Look, they represent yeah. a radical break from the past. Um, no generational gap as deep as the one we are seeing today in China. So anybody who wants to understand China, work with China, work in China, connect with China, has to understand the mindset and the psyche of the new generation. Radically different. Uh, just look at the, 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 the kind of experience they have gone through compared to their parents. So in Italy, very confident, and there's a sense of pride, pride of China, the nation, what it's accomplished and its innovation, and um, a sense of, you know, sense of wanting to be part of a community. So also part of uh, identity seeking, individualism. Uh, they are the one child policy generation, again, a radical break from the past. Um, so I think all of that, these social issues, uh, their vitality are really important. They're also more relaxed. You know, some people would call that lying flat. Somebody would call it, you know, just chill. Um, but, uh, you know, but they, 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 I think it's not, it's not a bad thing necessarily. There are no longer the Foxconn workers that would opt for three shifts a night that define China as it joined the WTO. This is a new generation unwilling sometimes to take up the manual labor more confident of their education and their abilities and innovativeness, and so striving for more. And that's just a cycle of renewal. That, these kind of jobs, that kind of opportunities get passed down to other countries. And um, you know, even despite the rise of AI, it's, it's that cycle. And they will represent a new future for China. So have to understand what they stand for, but also have to harness their, uh, their, their positivity, but they're currently challenged by the economic uh, conditions. Excellent. So we can maybe uh, afterwards talk about how we best understand that generation, if that's uh, um, what we need to, to understand China's future trends. But I want to open it to, to all of you. Uh, come in uh, with your comments, questions. Uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll collect a couple of questions, but let me start here in the, in the first row. Uh, and please quickly uh, introduce yourself and uh, um, yeah, address okay. your question. Um, I'm from Jing Solo. We are a renewable energy company. So my question is to uh, Professor Fu. Uh, the future you describe is so promising and pro uh, optimistic, but why more and more Chinese entrepreneur owners, particularly small and medium entrepreneurs, they are getting more anxious and uh, worry about the future. They, what they see is the um, less opportunity and uh, the slow pace of growth and uh, the increasing pressure from um, uh, carbon emission, net zero, growth, et cetera. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm from the renewable energy, I'm from solar. So I think we are, we are the, the big winner of this uh, sustainable era, but how, the, uh, how about the majority of business? What's the future for, uh, means for them? And uh, if the, this, uh, this future is fixed the trend, and how they adapt themselves to this trend. Mm. This is a question to, you, uh, to, uh, to Professor Fu. And my question to Professor Jing. And uh, regarding to the innovation, so, you know, what you mean the innovation is referred to the AI or the uh, sustainable EV or uh, storage, this kind of new business. But you know that the 90% um, the is the traditional industries like the steel or paper, blah, 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 blah and manufacturing and uh, others. So what the innovation for them, we too focus the innovation refer to the, like the new technology, AI or internet or kind of things. But uh, uh, what for the, the majority of business, what an innovation for them, what they can do, you mean they shift their business to AI? Yeah. Oh. Great, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, for those two questions. Let me collect maybe one, one more. Uh, yes, gentlemen in the back, uh, in the very back row, yes. And then I'll uh, let you answer, but uh, first, gentlemen in the back. I thank, thank you very much. My name is Bharat. Uh, I represent uh, Indian Technology Company. Uh, great session, thank you very much. Uh, uh, building on the lady I just mentioned, the declining birth rate, uh, seriously 
making an impact on the real estate, uh, you know, in terms of new housing sales, impact the new work culture impacting the commercial real estate, uh, the declining commercial and residential real estate impacting steel industry and cement, huge capacities not being able to fulfill, and the divide between tier one and tier two uh, within the China city ecosystem. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about that and see how that's shaping out in the coming five, ten years? Thank you. All right. Great. I think we have a theme here about how this transition plays out across the economy and uh, tier one, tier two. Uh, two minutes each. Uh, who wants to start? Uh, okay. Could you do want um, to start? Small and medium uh, companies, very, very, very challenging. Um, and very challenging in China. Uh, and um, adding to your list is the cost of capital. And this has to do with the Chinese financial system, layers and layers of cost of capital added down. Uh, when it trickles to the real economy, the burden for the companies are very large. I have to say that we have to believe in some forces of the market playing a very important role. I talked about the role of the state, very critical. But in China's state today, it should be efficiently allocated by the market. So when there, there's an influx of too much capital into one sector and oversupply, that the market should self-correct. And that, I think, was one of the painful lessons of this industrialization period. And going forward, more markets, less state. But the state is being still, still very critical. Um, on the fertility, a uh, very, very important question. You've got to ask, why are people having so few children, right? Why are they not even getting married? Is it be maybe it's because of the housing prices. And so the causation uh, correlation is, you know, is, is going in both directions. And I think this is one of the focus of the new paradigm, the kind of focusing on people's well-being and feeling less angst and social uh, anxiety in the age of AI, but in China in the you know, reduced opportunities. Um, so this is something that the government is trying to solve over time. I think very difficult, but they're putting maximal efforts. I think you pointed out a very important um, uh, uh, continued uh, developmental uh, uh, kind of force in China, which is urbanization. Uh, this is not so much between first and second tier cities. I think the bis biggest gap is second and third and fourth, fifth tier cities. So urbanization is only about halfway done. So that's one pent up demand for housing prices still. You, everybody wants a, an apartment in the urban areas. And that geographical inequality is actually the biggest source of inequality in a place like China, rather than compared to the US and Europe and other countries. So again, the right kind of policies will be to allow for better migration across sectors, across countries, sorry, across regions, and better flow of goods. There's still a lot of distortions. And again, that is also a focal point of the government. But that's going to take 10 years to play out. Great. Thank you. Shalom. I think two, uh, three very good questions. I start from uh, innovation. Innovation, actually, there are groundbreaking innovation, and there are also diffusionary imitative innovation. So this type of innovation, not on, maybe not new to the world, but new to the country, new to your firm, new to your, 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 your region. So this is also innovation. So um, in terms of um, when we talk about innovation in the traditional industry, that could be in, you know, enhance your efficiency, uh, enhance your productivity, and then reduce the cost. Um, but also there could be new industries like the AI world. That's one, but in traditional industry, there could be you know, better uh, quality, new products in your, in your traditional industry and better quality, great efficiency. And also there are two major trends, digital transformation and the green transformation. All this will require innovation to achieve. So these are all the opportunities for the traditional industries to innovate. Uh, not necessarily everybody have to, to go to the old AI industries but in your own industry, and do this become the number one or the top 10 in the world, in your own industry, is also innovation. That needs a lot of innovation. And now comes to, you know, what's the, the, the current situation in China? China come to the, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, top of the first growth curve, and it's preparing the second growth curve. This is a very important transition period. And this was added by the post-pandemic recovery, shock, shock of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. So all this together make the current time is very difficult. However, as for me, I, I was born in the 1960s. I worked 
until my 32 years old, I uh, went abroad. So in my life in China, in the past 40 years, I have seen economic crisis or some political difficult times. I have seen inflation rates higher than two digits. And this, the country went through, went through all these difficulties. And currently, it's the two cycles come together. The long economic cycle, transition, and the pandemic shock recovery add up together. However, the hope is the future. Is one China build up the innovation capacity and go through the digital transformation and the green transformation and other innovations, the country will pick up its capacity. So look at the world in comparison. Um, it's a difficult time for every country, difficult time for every country, but I think we all, will all go through. Now look at China's kind of um, um, uh, the, the young generation in, um, and also the societal uh, um, challenges. I think for the young generation, you know, why they don't um, want to have more children, even the government changed their, their policy. It's a comprehensive social problem come together. It's not a, uh, only a one-child policy issue, it's also about the privatization of education, privatization of healthcare, and the income e inequality in the society, the, major, you know, the, the wealth, the economic growth and the gains goes to a small proportion of very rich. All these all come together led to the majority of the people, they feel much more burdened and, and the, the young generation don't want to um, have children because of the burden, and the people save a lot to prepare for healthcare and uh, education. So it's a comprehensive social change needed. So that's why the Chinese modernization, five characteristics bring up all together to change the society and the economy. I think that's the right direction, although it takes time takes time you know, for the whole system change. Right. Well, thank you very much. In many ways, that was meant as a kickoff of many discussions to be had uh, over this uh, annual meeting of the new champions. Thank you very much to the speakers. <laughs> and we wish you a very productive and impactful meeting. Thank you very much.